Welcome back to the second and final installment of the Passion Tide chapter in Maria von Trapp's book, Around the Year with the Trapp Family. Copyright 1955. This book is not a theological treatise, but the recollection of a pious Catholic mother who brought her family's Austrian Catholic traditions to America when they were compelled to relocate after World War II. This subheading is entitled Holy Week. According to an old tradition, the first three days of Holy Week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, are dedicated to spring cleaning. In the days before the invention of the vacuum cleaner, this was a spectacular undertaking. Sofas, easy chairs, and all mattresses would be carried out of the house and beaten mercilessly with a tippic pracker, or a carpet beater. Walls were dusted, curtains were changed, a thorough domestic upheaval. There is little time for cooking, and meals are made of leftovers. By Wednesday night, the house looks spick and span, and now the great fire oven begins. Fire oven is an untranslatable word. It really means vigil, evening before a feast, the evening before Sunday, when work ceases earlier than any other weekday, in order to allow time to get into the mood to celebrate. Fire means to celebrate. Abend means evening. From now on until the Tuesday after Easter, no unnecessary work will be done on our place. These days are set aside for our Lord. On Wednesday, with all satisfaction of having set our house at peace, and after the dishes of a simple early supper are finished, we go down to the village church in Stowe for the first tenebrae service. In the sanctuary, a large wrought iron triangular candlestick is put up with fifteen dark candles. We take our places in the choir and the solemn chanting of matins and lauds begins. This is the first part of the divine office, which has been recited daily around the world by all priests and many religious since the early times of the church. In the cathedrals and many monasteries it is chanted in common. For the last days of Holy Week it is performed in public, so to speak, not only in the cathedral churches, but in any church, so that the faithful may take part in it. We always consider this the greatest honor for us, the singing family, the greatest reward for all the trouble that goes along with life in public, that we can sing for all the divine offices in church. Matins has three nocturnes, each one consisting of three psalms with their antiphons and three lessons. The first nocturne is always the most solemn one. We sing all the psalms in their respective tonus. We sing the antiphons, some in Gregorian chant, some from the compositions of the old masters, such as Palestrina, Lassus, and Vittorio. The lessons were sung last year by Father Wassner, Werner, and Johannes. In the second and third nocturne, we only recite the psalms in recto tono, in order not to make it too long. Some of the antiphons and all of the lessons, however, are sung. After each psalm, the altar boy extinguishes a candle, reminding us of how one apostle after the other left our Lord. Matins is followed by lauds, consisting of five psalms and antiphons which we recite. At the end of lauds there is only one candle left, the symbol of our Lord all by himself, crying out, Where are you, O my people? And we, in the name of all the people, recite now the Miserere, the famous penitential psalm, while the altar boy is carrying the last candle behind the altar, and the church is now in complete darkness. At the end of the Miserere, we all make a banging sound with the breviary books. This custom is quite ancient. It is supposed to indicate the earthquake at the moment of the resurrection. After this noise, the altar boy emerges from behind the altar with the burning Christ candle and puts it back on the candlestick. This is a ray of hope, anticipating the glorious Easter night. In Austria, the tenebrae service is called Pumpernetta, or Noisy Matins. The congregation is following closely with booklets in which the whole service, which we sing in Latin, is given in English. This is the most moving evening service of the whole year. When we sing Tenebrae Facta Sunt, an awesome silence falls upon the whole church. And when we sing the famous Improperio Populumeus by Palestrina, we are all moved to the depths. Is there anything more heart-rending than to listen to the outcry of the anxious Redeemer, my people, what have I done to thee? Or in what have I grieved thee? Answer me. What more ought I to do for thee that I have not done? 
On the morning of Holy Thursday, the Church in her service tries most movingly to combine the celebration of the two great events she wants to commemorate. Quote, Who lives in memory of him, our Lord had said on the first Holy Thursday when he gave himself to us in the Holy Eucharist, and, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. This cry he uttered only a few hours later. Therefore, as the solemn Mass begins, the festive strains of the organ accompany the chant of the introit and curie, and when the priest intones the Gloria, all the bells on the steeple, as well as in the church, ring together once more for the last time, because right afterwards, Holy Church as the Bride of Christ goes into mourning, as she accompanies the bridegroom through his hours of unspeakable suffering. The organ remains silent when she reminds the faithful in the gradual, Christ became obedient unto us to death, even unto the death of the cross. The gospel of this day tells of the lesson Jesus gave us in brotherly love and humility as he first washed the feet of his disciples, afterward saying, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If then I, being your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that as I have done to you, so you do also. Therefore, in all cathedrals and abbey churches, the bishops and abbots go down on their knees on this day after Holy Mass and wash the feet of the twelve oldest members of their communities. It is wonderful that in our days more and more parishes are adopting this beautiful custom, which brings home to us better than the most eloquent sermon that we should remember this word of our Lord. For I have given you an example, that as I have done to you, so you do also. Which should become increasingly the watchword in our daily life. This is what the Church wants us to take home with us on that day, the attitude of washing one another's feet. And because we Catholics have not awakened to this fact, we are rightly to be blamed for all wrong and injustice and wars going on in the world. As Good Friday has no Mass of its own, but only the Mass of the Presanctified, an extra big host was consecrated by the priest during Mass on Holy Thursday, which is put into a chalice and covered up with a white cloth. This chalice is now incensed immediately after Mass, and carried in solemn procession to the altar of repose, while the Pange Lingua is chanted solemnly. This repository should remind us of the prison in which our Lord was kept that terrible night from Thursday to Friday. Unlike that first night, where he was all alone after all the apostles had fled, the faithful now take turns in keeping watch. There is an old legend circulating in the old country, still fervently believed by the children, that all the bells fly to Rome on Holy Thursday, where the Holy Father blesses them. They return in time for the Gloria on Holy Saturday. Another custom still alive in the villages throughout Austria is this. As the bell cannot be rung for the Angelus on these three days, the altar boys man their outdoor rachen, a kind of rattle looking like a toy wheelbarrow, whose one wheel grinds out a deafening noise. They race through the streets, stopping at certain previously designated corners, lifting up their rachen and chanting in chorus. All right, I'm going to try this one, guys. Wir rachen rachen soon, englischen Gruß, den jeder katholische Christ beten muss, which means, we remind you by this noise of the Angelus, of a prayer to be said by every faithful Christian. Needless to say, many a little boy's heart waits eagerly for these three holy days. While he might be too young to understand the great thoughts of Holy Week, he certainly is wide awake to his own responsibility of reminding his fellow men, time to pray. My son Werner is living with his family just a little way down the road. When his little boys, Martin and Bernard, are big enough to shoulder the responsibility, their father will make them such an old world rotchen, and their mother will teach them the rhyme going with it. In the house also, the bells have to be silenced. The bell rung for the meals or for family devotions is replaced by a hand clapper worked by the youngest member of the family, who announces solemnly from door to door that lunch is ready. Holy Thursday has a menu all its own. For the noon meal, we have the traditional spring herb soup. We'll add the recipe for this soup in the show notes. Afterwards, there is the traditional spinach with fried eggs. In Austria, Holy Thursday is called 
Green Donnerstag, or Green Thursday. Many people think that the word grün stands for the color, but this is not so. It derives from the ancient German word grünen, meaning to cry or to moan. Nevertheless, Green Donnerstag will have its green lunch. The evening of Holy Thursday finds us in our Sunday best around the dining room table. Standing, we listen to the gospel describing the happenings in the upper room. On the table is a bowl with bitter herbs, such as parsley, chives, and celery greens, another bowl with a sauce the Orthodox Jews use when celebrating their pash, and plates with unleavened bread and matzos can be obtained from any Jewish delicatessen store, but also can be made at home. We'll add the recipe for unleavened bread also in the show notes. Then comes the feast day meal of a yearling lamb roasted, eaten with bitter herbs and the traditional sauce. Each time we dip the herbs in the sauce, we remember our Lord answering sadly the question of the apostles as to who was the traitor. Quote, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, he shall betray me. Afterwards, the table is cleared, and in front of Father Wastner's place is put a tray filled with wine glasses and a silver plate with unleavened bread. While breaking up portions of the bread, he blesses the bread and wine individually and hands it to each one around the table, and we drink and eat, remembering our Lord, who must have celebrated such a love feast many times with his apostles. This was the custom in his days, just as we in our time will give a party on the occasion of the departure of a member of the family or a good friend, the people in the time of Christ used to clear the table after a good meal and bring some special wine and bread, and in the breaking of the bread they would signify their love for the departing one. The first Christians took over this custom, and after having celebrated the Eucharist together, they would assemble in a home for an agape, the Greek word for love feast. To share bread and wine together in this fashion, therefore, was not in itself startling to the apostles, but the occasion was memorable on this first Holy Thursday, because it was our Lord's own great farewell. As we thus celebrate the breaking of the bread around our table at home, we keep thinking of the words he had said immediately before, quote, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Every Holy Thursday night spent like this knits a family closer together, careful to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, as St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians. On Good Friday, Holy Mother Church gives her children a beautiful opportunity for a profession of faith, the adoration of the cross. Behind the priest and altar boys follows the whole congregation. We remove our shoes when we go to adore the cross. Three times we prostrate ourselves as we come closer, until we finally bend over and kiss the feet of the crucified. As we, the church choir, follow right behind the priest, we sing during the rest of the adoration. Our songs are the heart-rendingly moving Crux Fidelis by King John of Portugal and Eberlin's Tenebre Factu Sunt of such haunting beauty. When the adoration of the cross is finished, the candles on the altar are lighted, the cross is most reverently taken up from the floor and placed on the altar, and a procession forms to get the blessed sacrament from the altar of repose. During this procession, the hymn Vexilla Regis is sung, and then follows a ceremony that is not a real Mass, although it is called the Mass of the Presanctified. The priest consumes the host that was consecrated the day before. On the anniversary of our Lord's death, the bloody sacrifice, the Church does not celebrate the symbol of the unbloody sacrifice. After the official service is finished, the altar is stripped again. The tabernacle is left open. No vigil light burns in the sanctuary, but in the front of the empty tabernacle lies the crucifix on the steps of the altar, and the people come all day during the day for adoration. In Austria, another custom was added. At the end of the official service, the priest would carry the blessed sacrament in a monstrance covered with a transparent veil and expose it on the side altar, where a replica of the Holy Sepulchre had been set up with more or less historic accuracy with more or less taste, but always with the best of will. Like the creche around Christmas time, so the Holy Sepulchre on Good Friday would be an object of pride for every parish, one parish trying to outdo the other. 
that people in Salzburg used to go around at Christmas time and in Holy Week to visit the Christ Child Cribs and the Holy Sepulchres and all thirty five churches of the town, comparing and criticizing. There would be literally hundreds of vigil lights surrounding the body of Christ in the tomb of rock, which was almost hidden beneath masses of flowers. There would be a guard of honor, not only of the soldiers, but also of firemen in uniform and of war veterans with picturesque plumed hats. I still remember the atmosphere of holy awe stealing over my little heart when as a child I would make the rounds of the churches. There in the holy sepulchre he would rest now, watched over by his faithful until holy Saturday afternoon. Here in America we have found another lovely custom, people going from church to church not on Good Friday, but on Holy Thursday. On that day the churches are decorated with a profusion of flowers as a sign of love and gratitude for the Holy Eucharist. The contrast with the bare churches the day after on Good Friday is all the more striking and gives a tremendous feeling of desolation. Good Friday is a very quiet day with us. There is little to do in the kitchen, since fasting is observed rigorously on this day. We have no breakfast, and all that is served for lunch on a bare table without a tablecloth is one pot of thick soup, Einbrennsuppe, which everyone eats standing up in silence. There is little noise around the house. Talking is restricted to the bare essentials, as it would be if a dearly beloved were lying dead in the house. As we are so privileged as to have a chapel in our house, we use the day when the holy house of God is empty and desolate to clean and polish all the sacred vessels and chalices and the ciborium, the monstrance, the candlesticks, and the censer. The vigil light before the picture of the Blessed Mother in the living room is also extinguished, because on Good Friday Christ, the light of the world, is dead. From twelve until three, the hours of our Lord's agony on the cross, all activity stops. We sit together in the empty chapel before the cross and spend these hours in prayer, meditation, and spiritual reading. From time to time we rise and sing one or the other of the beautiful Lenten hymns and motets. On Holy Saturday, a new stir of activity starts in the kitchen. Eggs are boiled in different pots containing various dyes, blue, green, purple, yellow, and red. Every member of the household who wants to participate in this art takes some eggs to his or her room, after they have dried, to work on them in secret. One takes some muriatic acid, with which she etches the most intriguing patterns out of the colored foundation. It is quite popular in our house to etch the first line of the Easter songs, the staves, notes, and words. Our cleverest artist sits with paint and brush, and under her fingers appear pictures of an Easter lamb, or of our risen Savior himself, or of the Blessed Mother, or of the different patron saints of the family. Sometimes they turn out to be little gems. Others fasten dried ferns or little maple leaves or other herbs around the eggs before they are boiled and die. When these leaves are finally taken off, the shape of the flowers and herbs remains white, while the rest of the egg is colored. This is easily done and looks very pretty. These eggs first appear on trays and in bowls on Easter Sunday morning at the foot of the altar for the solemn blessing of the food. Afterward, they will be distributed at the solemn Easter breakfast. Nota bene. Maria provides such a wonderful example, doesn't she, of bringing home a spirit of mindfulness during Holy Week. When you are able to incorporate these traditional Catholic understandings of how to live the faith in our homes every day throughout the liturgical year, like the Von Trapps did, you reap the benefits lost and forgotten in our modern times, so smothered by worldliness that true spiritual joy is never felt by most people. Easter, which for most is little more than fits in a shallow basket filled with plastic grass and candy, should be the height of joy almost a giddy spiritual happiness, which is deserved by those who seriously undertake a penitential Lent and then join the church in all her preparation and prayer during Holy Week. There is nothing like it. If you know, you know. If you don't know, maybe this is the year to find out. Our best wishes to all for a fruitful and blessed Holy Week. Stay tuned next week for Maria's chapter on Paschal Tide. <music> 